this morning. It's uh, good that you're all here. Um, special welcome to any guests we might have and hope that uh, you return. We'd like everyone to uh, sign the yellow cards that are in the pew racks. Uh, so fill those out, drop them in the offering plate when that comes by a little bit later in the service. Uh, we're still uh, receiving communion in the pews. We'll do this as long as um, the levels, the, uh, the COVID levels are high, which they still are for uh, Sandusky and the surrounding uh, counties. Um, does everyone have, if, if, if you don't have communion and you need it, just raise your hand and we'll bring it to you. Anyone need that? Okay. Um, a few other announcements to call to your attention. You do have the yellow insert in your bulletin. Take a look at that. Uh, information about Spirit, our, our midweek Wednesday program, and then Dinner Church uh, is a part of that, uh, beginning at, uh, well, dinner at 5 o'clock. And then we're going to start the worship at about 5.10. Just a brief uh, uh, worship in the dining room uh, around the tables. So hope you um, consider joining us for that. And then also our other activities, including... Uh, choirs and Bible study, um, so uh, we're getting geared up for that. Uh, the, also gearing up for other our, of our fall activities, including Sunday school. We're going to be trying something a little bit different with Sunday school this year, an intergenerational um, program that Heather is working on and will be leading for us. <coughs> also uh, confirmation uh, jointly with the Lyft congregations. And then we have rescheduled our block party uh, for uh, the afternoon of Sunday, October 24th. And the, that committee will be meeting again soon to um, finish uh, those uh, plans. Of course, things have to be a little bit different um, uh, for that event. But that will happen, hopefully, um, on October 24th. I think that's all we have by way of announcement, so we'll begin worship with confession and give forgiveness and let us stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider. Help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. We sing the hymn.
the grace and peace of Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead to bring everlasting hope, be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, your word feeds your people with life that is eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth that, renouncing all that is false and evil, we may live in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. First reading is from Joshua 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. They presented themselves before God, and Joshua said to all the people, Now therefore revere the Lord and serve in him serenity and in faithfulness put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and served the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the Lord people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery and who did these great things, signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went and among all the peoples who, through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before all the peoples the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we shall serve the Lord, for he is our God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be God. Second reading is from Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God 
so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever you will make that will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Take, pray in the Spirit of all, in all time, at all times in every prayer and supplication. To, end, to that end, keep alert and always preserve, persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known the boldness, the mystery of the gospel. For I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Word of God, word of life. Good morning. It's time for the children's message. So I have a question for you this morning, Macy. Have you seen a softball or a baseball game recently? Yeah. Did you play t-ball or softball? Yeah, you did. So do you know what position this person is playing in this picture? Yeah, this is the catcher. And the catcher's wearing some special equipment, aren't they? What kind of special stuff does this girl in this picture have on? Is there something special about it? Does she have a helmet and a breastplate and some shin guards to protect her from being hit by the ball? Yeah, so a catcher has to wear some special equipment so that they don't get hurt. But did you know that the Bible tells us about some special equipment that we need to wear too? Yeah, it tells us, if you listen to um, Richard up there talking, it talks about the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and feet fitted with the gospel of peace, a shield of faith and a helmet of salvation. And then I have one more. The sword of the spirit. What do you think the sword of the spirit could be? It's something that's going to help protect us. And it's kind of a trick question because it's not very, it doesn't look, in, in life, it doesn't look like a sword. It looks a lot different. And you can usually find some of these swords of the spirit in our pews. And here's a hint. It's a book. What book do you think would be the sword of the spirit? The Bible. Very good. So we need the Bible to protect us. And these are all things that God gives us for our protection here. I invite you to join me in prayer and the congregation may join along. Dear God, thank you for the protection that you have given us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they die. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. 
When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Oh God, while we were yet lost and one wandering in the ways of the world, you saw our great need and sent a Savior. Call us again, Lord, to be your people and make of us your blessings. In your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to begin today by telling you a little story There was a man who had recently broken his leg quite severely. The doctors had to do surgery, put in a pin. There was some question as to whether he would be able to walk normally again. But he was very determined that he would, so he took every opportunity to exercise and walk, sometimes walking long distances through the countryside. But one day he was out in the country walking when his leg began to hurt him quite badly. He hoped that someone would come along soon who might be able to give him a ride. It just so happened that a rancher happened along riding a horse. The man explained to the rancher his dilemma, and the rancher was very accommodating. I have some fence to men in this area, he said, so while I'm doing that, you can ride my horse into town and then send one of my hands to come back and pick me up later. But before I let you go with the horse, I have to tell you some things about him. This horse used to be owned by a preacher who taught him some unusual cues. When you want him to go, you don't say, giddy up. You say, praise the Lord. When you want him to go faster, you say, praise the Lord again. And then when you want to stop, you don't say, whoa, you say, amen. Well, grateful for the rancher's generosity, the man got on the horse, settled himself in the saddle, and said, praise the Lord. Horse horse moved right out. He decided to ride a little faster, so he said, praise the Lord again, and horse took off into a a gallop. Road was winding, going downward and round a bend. He had never been down this road before. He didn't know what was there. And as he came around the curve, he immediately saw what looked like a riverbank, and the bridge was gone. He knew he was going to have to stop, so he started pulling on the reins and saying, whoa, whoa, but of course the horse didn't stop. He was getting closer and closer to the edge of the riverbank, and his mind started to race, and he began to panic. What was that word I was supposed to use to get him to stop, he thought? And just as he was able to see how deep of a gorge it was over the river, he remembered the right word, amen. He, so he shouted that out, and the horse stopped just inches before he would have plunged over the bank and into the river. The man sighed a deep sigh of relief, wiped his forehead with the back of his hand, and without thinking, he said, praise the Lord. This little story is in some ways symbolic of our life. Whether we recognize it or not, we are often at the edge of something. Sometimes we find ourselves falling over the edge, and then we have to find ways of getting ourselves out of the mess that we've gotten ourselves into Whether we go over the edge or are able to avoid it, the fact still remains that every decision, every choice, every commitment you make, be it ever so small or seemingly insignificant at the time, has its effect on the course of your life. I'd like to focus this morning specifically on commitment. The commitments we make in life are very important and can sometimes determine whether 
or not we will just go up to the brink or over it. I'd like to talk for a bit about some of the things that are involved in sustaining a continuous, unwavering commitment to a cause, a goal, a personal relationship. Specifically, I want to talk about an unwavering commitment to the person of Jesus Christ. Over the past few Sundays, the theme of our gospel texts has been the bread of life. We began with the bread that Jesus used to feed 5,000 people. Then we learned that the bread of life is more than ordinary physical bread. It is also spiritual bread and so includes such spiritual things as hope, faith, purpose, vision, love, peace, forgiveness, all the ingredients that put quality into living every day while at the same time gives us a taste of the eternity God has promised. In last Sunday's text, the bread of life, it is Jesus Christ himself in the forms of bread and wine. As Maureen, in her message to us last Sunday, spoke of how we eat to live. It is also spiritual bread, and so includes such spiritual things as hope, faith, person, purpose, vision, love, and peace. And now that we have tasted the bread, both the bread that satisfies hunger and the bread that does not spoil, both the physical and the spiritual bread, what next? Has it been just a tasty picnic that is getting old and boring? Or has it opened up something to us that demands our continuing commitment? If so, are we up to keeping that commitment? The feeding of the 5,000 was like a honeymoon for the people. Bread of life were words with a good sound in the people's ears until they realized that Jesus was not going to be a permanent fast food restaurant where everything in the menu is free. Once they got the message that Jesus was talking about unseen matters like belief, hope, purpose, commitment, decision, making, and choices, their interest rapidly dwindled. Part of the problem was that they couldn't stomach Jesus' talk about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. They did what we all do when we can't stomach something or somebody. They voted with their feet. The text puts it this way. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? And then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Do you also want to leave me? And Peter responded with the words that we often sing before the gospel lesson, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter's response to Jesus suggests three things about commitment. First of all, commitment begins with a decision. Life is full of decisions, and we make them every day. President Reagan enjoyed telling a story of how he learned to make firm decisions. A kindly aunt had taken him to a cobbler to have a pair of shoes custom made for him. The shoemaker asked, do you want a round toe or a square toe? Young Ronald hemmed and hawed, and so the cobbler said, come back in a day or two and tell me what you want. A few days later, the cobbler saw young Reagan on the street and asked what he had decided about the shoes. I haven't made up my mind, Reagan answered. Very well, said the cobbler. Your shoes will be ready tomorrow. When Reagan got the shoes, one had a round toe and the other a square toe. And reflecting on this experience, Mr. Reagan said this, looking at those shoes every day taught me an important lesson. And it is this, if you don't make your own decisions, Someone else will make them for you. And how true that is. Commitment begins with a decision. But commitment is never a once-in-a-lifetime decision. And so, point two is this. Commitment is continuous, deciding and choosing. Commitment is required at the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, or the week, the year, the month, the decade, and at the end of those time periods. It is born out of a continuous wrestling with alternatives. 
The tragic scenes and reports from the fall of Afghanistan illustrate how the commitments of millions of people in different parts of the world have involved continuous deciding and choosing. Our nation began that war 20 years ago, seeking to hold accountable those who were responsible for the attacks on 9-11 that killed 3,000 Americans. But that war dragged on for 20 years. You may remember that President Obama decided to deploy thousands of more troops in 2009, popularly remembered as the surge. The result was the Taliban was beaten back but at a high cost of American lives. Too many Americans lost their lives. Countless more have lived with disabilities, both physical and mental, ever since. But on our behalf, they made the decision to go. They made the commitment to go, to serve and fight, and we owe them our enduring thanks and respect. For many years, Pastor Bill Lavin served our fellow Eastern Conference congregation, St. John's, on US 250, south of Sandusky. And during that time, he was a reserve military chaplain and served several tours in Afghanistan. He left his call at St. John's to pursue full-time military chaplaincy. And this past week, he posted a photo of a flag memorial to fallen soldiers in Afghanistan on Facebook with this comment. He said, thinking today about those who gave all in a noble cause and praying for their friends and families whose grief remains complicated. Who would have thought when this photo was taken in February 2011, it would represent the halfway point in a 20-year conflict? 20 years was too long for a war. So after many years of choosing and deciding, after thousands of military and civilian deaths, our leaders decided to end it. Presidents Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden, along with countless numbers of military and civilian personnel, made the decisions that led to the chaos we have been witnessing at the Kabul airport, and it is sure to continue through many, if not all, parts of the country and for an extended period of time. In the end, President Biden decided to continue the process that had already begun before he became president to end the war in Afghanistan. Exiting a war that we cannot, that we have not or cannot win will always be messy, chaotic, and tragic. Our hope and our prayer is that future leaders, when it comes to war, will continue to decide and choose not to begin one in the first place. In yours, in my life, it works like this. Every day and every hour, we make decisions about how we will live our life. Life is a continuous encounter with issues and people and are making decisions about them every day and every hour. So commitment begins with a decision, but more than that, commitment is continuous deciding and choosing. And that leads us to the third point, commitment is total. Story is told uh, about two men who had never been out of the city. They decided that they had it with city living, so they bought a a ranch down in Texas in order to live off the land like their great-grandparents once did. They decided to farm with horses. So the first thing they did was to find some to buy. They visited, visited a neighboring rancher and asked him if he had any to sell. Rancher said, no, I'm afraid not. They were disappointed, of course, but as they visited with the rancher for a few moments, one of them saw how some honeydew millions stacked against the barn and, uh, and asked, well, what are those? The rancher, seeing that the men were hopeless city slickers, decided to have some fun. Oh, he answered, those are horse eggs. You take one of those eggs home and wait for it to hatch, and then you'll have a horse. City slickers were overjoyed at this, so they bought one of the melons, headed down the bumpy country road toward their own ranch. Suddenly, they hit a bump, and the honeydew melon bounced out of the back of their pickup truck, hit the road, and of course, broke open. The driver noticed what had happened and started to turn the truck around to go retrieve their horse egg. Meanwhile, a jackrabbit came hopping by and saw this honeydew melon burst on the road, hopped over to it, and, and standing in the middle of the mess, began to eat. Now here came the two city slickers. They spied their horse egg, burst open, and this long-eared creature in the middle of it, 
One of the men shouted, our horse hag is hatched. Let's go get our horse. But seeing these two men coming toward it, the jackrabbit took off hopping in every direction with those two city boys in hot pursuit. Two city boys gave everything, gave it everything they had to catch him, but finally they could go no further. They both fell to the ground, gasping for air, while the jackrabbit hopped off into the distance. And raising up on his elbow, one of the men said to the other, Well, I guess we lost our horse. The other man nodded grimly. Yes, but you know, he said, I'm not sure I wanted to plow that fast anyway. Now, this silly story might ask us to ask, it might lead us to ask ourselves. How committed are we? For the city slickers in the story, the commitment seemed to be less than total. But if commitment is going to mean anything, it needs to be total. General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, was asked the secret of his amazing Christian life. Booth answered, I told the Lord that he could have all that there is of William Booth. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, Peter says. We have here a picture of commitment. Commitment that began with a decision for Christ. A commitment that Peter continued to make until tradition says he was crucified upside down for being faithful to Christ. And commitment that was total. As we are about to begin a new fall season with its many demands and opportunities, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will work in us the same kind of commitment. Amen. We sing the prayer. We sing the hymn.
Let us join together as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of courage, bless all leaders of your church. Make them ready to proclaim the gospel of peace and strengthen them to preach your loving word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, bless fields and orchards. Protect the land from drought and bring life-giving giving rain to support growth. Instruct your people in wise treatment of the world you have provided for all your creatures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, bless all who seek justice between nations and peoples. Give guidance to bridge builders, heal divisions, and inspire cooperation in times of crisis, disaster, and war. We especially pray for the people of Haiti today as they wait for relief from the earthquake and rains that followed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, bless all who are in need. Accompany all who are lonely and feeling abandoned and remind them of your abiding presence. We pray today for all who stand in need of your healing power and we lift up Pastor Jim, Danny, Jim, Nathan, Bill, Ed, Nancy, and Sharon. Accompany all who are persecuted and exploited and open us to their cries. Lord, we remember the people of Afghanistan and we ask for your hand of protection and justice to be with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of change, bless our transitions. Guide all who are embarking on new stages in life, such as a job, a new school, or a new community. Sustain enduring friendships and kindle new relationships and interests. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the church, be with this congregation as we continue through the transition phase of the call process and we move toward the calling of a new pastor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort, bless all who mourn the deaths of their loved ones. We give thanks for the saints who have gone before us. Renew our confidence in your promise of resurrection and life in the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of peace with one another from your pew, those around you. You may be seated. We will now receive the offering. And would you please um, make sure that you have filled out the yellow welcome card and that you place it in the offering plate as it goes by.
His consoler and power, the protection of His child and treasure, is a charge that on Himself He laid. As thy days, thy strength shall be in Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us, Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. At this time, you would prepare your communion elements for receiving.
Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood strengthen and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. We sing the hymn. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.